Hello. Yeah, yes, you are audible. You are audible. Am I audible? Yes, sir, you Am are audible. Yeah. Am I visible also? Yes, sir, you are visible also. Okay. <clears throat> Good evening, students. Shall we start? Are you ready? Or should we wait for another five minutes? Okay, we need volunteers. <clears throat> Today we will be having sporters. Well, uh, I will show about 30, 35 sporters. And uh, we need volunteers to interpret it and discuss it. So unless there are volunteers to discuss the uh, sporters, we cannot take it forwards. So good luck to everybody. Let us have a training program. Okay, so we will start with uh, an electrocardiogram. This is the electrocardiogram of a patient, patient who is admitted with anterior myocardial infarction. So, you can look at the electrocardiogram and interpret it. You can look at the rhythm strip also, which is uh, lead to and V1. Uh, the upper one is lead two and the lower one is V1. And you have the 12 liter electrocardiogram also. Any volunteers to interpret the electrocardiogram? The 12 lead electrocardiogram is not very difficult. You can start with the 12 lead electrocardiogram and then come to the rhythm strip. Any volunteers? Roshan? Would you like to try? Saroj, would you like to try? Yes, sir. Sir, in the first, uh, uh, not in the rhythm strip, sir, in this strip, sir, we can see that, uh, sir, uh, P waves are very well seen. Sir, the, uh, uh, sir, QRBB is seen in the V1. 
so there is a right axis deviation uh, so, uh, so not in the rhythm strip in the other 12 leaves so i can see uh, uh, so there is a p waves uh, are seen sir okay p waves are regularly seen then <clears throat> He yes. has good evidence of right bundle branch block. And with the is there. Yeah. There is evidence of uh, anterior myocardial infarction as evidenced by uh, Q waves in lead 1, uh, V1, V2, V3, V4. And there is some degree of ST elevation also seen in V3 and V4. So it's a recent anterior myocardial infarction. And what is the explanation for your this uh, right axis deviation? X about 105, 110. So, whether left posterior hemiblock is present? Yeah, that, that, yeah the interest of uh, uh, anterior migraine infarction, RBB, and then there is a right axis deviation. I think it's correct to conclude that the patient may be having a right posterior, sorry, left posterior block also. Okay, right. Yes, very good. Left posterior hemiblock. Yes, sir. Okay, now uh, coming to the uh, rhythm strip. Yes, sir. In the rhythm strip, sir, uh, I can see that uh, in the uh, third uh, third um, beat is preceded by P wave, and there is a uh, sir morphology of the QRS has been changed from first and second. First and second are narrow QRS, whereas the third beat is a wide QRS. Okay. And, and sir, uh, uh, fourth, fifth, and sixth, they are also sir wider QRS. Again, sir, it is followed by narrow QRS. So, sir, there is intermittent bundle branch block is developing. Uh, no, see, you already has got a right bundle branch block. Yes, sir. Uh, then, sir... Uh, see, uh, see, one clue. See, when you look at the rhythm strip, is there a change in the pattern of the QRS complex? Yes, sir. There is a... Uh, uh, in the uh, first strip, sir, it is... QRS complexes are changing, sir. But later on, sir, they are not changing. Is there a change? I don't think there's any change in the pattern of the QRS complex, but it is uh, the the conduction. Uh, conduction is uh, there are some AV block and all. But if so you look the at the... Strip, sir, in the above strip? Above strip is, I'm, uh, that is what I'm asking. In V1, is there sir. a change in the pattern? The first two, two beats, sir. First two beats. No, no, in V1. I'm asking V1. The lower one is V1 and the upper one is... Uh, lead 2. Lead 2. So, in lead 1, is there a change? V1, no, sir. In V1, there is no change, sir. No change at all. No. Why there is a uh, significant change seen in... Uh, lead 2. Limb, limb lead. Limb lead, lead 2. Yes. What is the condition in which in limb lead, there can be alteration in the QRS morphology, but there is no change in the pattern in the chest lead. The intermittent oh, you're right. branch block. Which one? Uh, so the, here, sir, in lead 2, we are seeing the S is slurred. So, uh, uh, sir, uh, that is... Uh, so, if you, if you try to interpret the axis of this uh, four QRS complex, what would be... Uh, uh, Left axis, sir. Left axis. It may be left axis. So anterior hemiblock, sir. Yeah, the left. Uh, this is left anterior hemiblock. This is left. You, you see that? See? You are interpreted this lead to here. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Intermittent yes, sir. left anterior hemiblock is developed. Yeah. So, it's an intermittent left anterior hemiblock and intermittent left posterior hemiblock. This is a posterior hemiblock. This is anterior hemiblock. So he has got, uh, there is some more uh, uh, com com complex uh, uh, AV conduction problem that I am not going into details. A clue, whenever you find that in the limb lead, in the chest lead, the QRS morphology is remaining the same. While in the limb lead, the QRS morphology is changing. It is mostly due to intermittent left anterior vesicular block and left posterior, block, posterior vesicular block. If there's intermittent anterior and posterior vesicular block, then you can get uh, the variation in the QRS morphology in the limb leads, but in the chest leads, they do not change. Because the, 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 the maximum change 
that can happen is uh, shifting from left hand left axis -hand deviation to right axis deviation. And that will not affect the QRS morphology in the chest leads. So if you find an electrocardiogram like this, where the chest leads are showing only a normal pattern, no change at all, while when it comes to a limb lead, you find that the morphology is changing from uh, right axis deviation to left axis deviation, then you should conclude that most likely it is intermittent left anterior vesicular and left posterior vesicular block. So what is the problem of this patient? What can happen to this patient? This patient can go into complete heart block, sir. Yes, uh, he has got a triphysicular block, and hence he has got a risk of going for a complete heart block. And actually, this patient went in for a complete heart block, and we had to put in a permanent pacemaker in him. Can you tell me a few uh, electrocardiographic uh, patterns which will uh, make you think that the patient is having a triphysicular block? So nine of them are there, at least cell four or five. Uh, sir, uh, uh, bifascicular block, RBB plus LAHB plus increased PR interval. Okay. Or sir, RBB with, uh, uh, sir, uh, uh, also the left posterior hemi block means right axis uh, along with increased PR interval. Okay. Sir, then complete left bundle branch block with increased PR interval. Okay. Sir, uh, intermittent, uh, intermittent, uh, sir, uh, the RBB and uh, LB uh, 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 inter intermittently, sir, we are seeing uh, RBB and LBB pattern. Okay, very good. One more, and then you know, this is another example uh, RBBB with uh, intermittent left hand physical block, left posterior physical block. This is a, this RBB with the le intermittent left anterior physical, left posterior physical, indicating that three physicals are involved. And a few other conditions in good, Morbid type 2 block, infrasin type of complete heart block. Anything else? Intermittent right bundle, intermittent left posterior physical block, left anterior physical block with first degree heart block. So these are a few conditions with the triphysical block. The relevance of triphysical block is that since we know that all the three physicals are uh, got disease, these patients are at a high risk of developing going in for a uh, complete heart block, and uh, they may require a permanent pacemaker. But, uh, but uh, you must remember that triphysical block by itself is not an indication for pacemaker ablation. Only when there is uh, symptoms or suggestive of a uh, uh, intermittent. Uh, uh, slowing of the heart or uh, detection of uh, AV block, complete AV block, then these patients require permanent pacemaker. And uh, these patients are prone candidates to, go in, to progress to uh, infra type of complete heart block. And uh, at, the, at least the proportion of these patients with triphysical heart block can develop complete heart block and may require permanent pacemaker implantation. Okay, right. Any doubts about triphysical heart block? How do you diagnose triphysical block? For, to diagnose triphysical block, there should be evidence that the right bundle is involved, left posterior physical is involved, left anterior physical is involved. Then only we can diagnose triphysical block. The problem, the problem of triphysical block is that these are candidates who can who are prone to develop complete heart block and may require a permanent base paper and mission. Okay, right. Any doubts? Okay, we'll go to the next one. Any volunteers? Saroj just tried now. Some other, some other, somebody else who can try. Volunteers. Anybody, you can try. Roshan, why can't you try? Sandosh. Ranjan, it hardly matters whether you made a wrong diagnosis or not, but I think unless you try to interpret electrocardiograms or spotters, you will not have the confidence to do it in the examination. Anybody? I'm surprised that uh, nobody is willing to uh, interpret an electrocardiogram. Okay, sir. sir I... 
Yeah, what is your name? Sir, I am Dr. Shri Ram. Oh, Shri Ram. Oh, Shri Ram has been uh, very good. I, I didn't see your name. Okay, Shri Ram. Yes. Uh, so, sir, so this is a 12 lead uh, standardized ECG, which is showing uh, uh, there is uh, absence uh, of uh, P wave uh, preceding the QRS complex. Uh, which is seen in uh, uh, two, three AVF, and actually uh, the P wave is inscribed uh, after the QRS complex. Yes, very good. Yes, in two, yes. three AVF. Yes. Um, and uh, uh, there is. Uh, um, one minute. Uh, there is. Um, Evidence of sir uh, old uh, old uh, anterior wall MI uh, as evidenced by Q in one AVL and uh, also Q in V one two. Lead one yes. AVL, uh, do you give so much importance to the uh, to the Q wave? Well, there is a. I agree with you. There is a QS pattern in as well as V1 in V one two. There is a rudimentary R in V three. You have got a. The point that there is a possibility that patient might have had uh, previous uh, yield uh, anterior migraine infarction, but I will be very diplomatic because there is no STD changes, there is no T, no ST change, no TUA change, nothing. So sometimes you can get QS pattern in B2 also, but I think to keep your mind open that this patient may, might have had a previous uh, anterior migraine infarction from which he has recovered and has healed. That's all right. Okay, yes. And uh, then there is a uh, uh, narrow complex tachycardia, sir, uh, in which uh, uh, P's we can see just after the QRS complex. Yes, yes. So okay. most probably it will be, uh, sir, AV, uh, AVRT. Okay, it could be an AVRT. Very good. Why did you say it's AVRT? Because we can see P waves, sir. In AV and RT, P is inscribed inside the QRS. Can you sometimes get P outside the QRS in AV and RT? Yes, sir. We can get in the terminal part of your QRS that pseudo S where is seen in lead 2. Not in this one. I'm asking a question. In a patient with AV and RT, can you, can you get the P wave outside the QRS complex? Sir, usually the uh, dis, uh, 70 millisecond, I think it differentiates between... Uh, the uh, uh, RP interval uh, less than 70 seconds is in AV and RT. I am not very sure. But. No, you are right that uh, when the uh, P is outside the QRS complex, usually in a patient with uh, AV and RT, usually the Q P is either fully inside the QRS complex or most of it is inside the QRS complex. But in AV RT, it is... Uh, uh, very often outside the QRS complex, and that is taken as a point to diagnose, differentiate between AVRT and AVNRT. Why it is so, Sri Ram? Why it is so? Uh, uh, sir, uh, because uh, uh, it depends on the uh, uh, depolarization. Like in a AVRT, uh, AVNRT, there is... Uh, um, I mean, in AVRT, there is uh, one after the other uh, activation, but in AVNRT, uh, AV there is simultaneous. Uh, yes, you are right. Why is this AVNRT is simultaneous? Because it is node de dependent. No, it is node dependent. Then you must explain it also. If the embers is, uh, which pathway takes the embers from ventricle to the atrium? It's got two parts, slow and the fast. Sir, oh. sir in case of uh, AV and RT, sir, uh, the, uh, the anti grade conduction is from the slow and the retrograde is from the fast of okay. the AV node itself. Sir. Okay. So, as a result, sir, the, the retrograde P wave is either buried into the QRS complex or just skipping from the QRS complex. Okay, right. Uh, see, uh, as uh, Saroj just rightly said, uh, the, the slow pathway conducts the embers anti grade and the fast pathway conducts it retrograde. Because of that, by the time the embers reaches the ventricle, 
because of the rapid conduction of the impulse into the atrium. It has already reached the atrium and then the atrium and the, and the ventricle may simultaneously depolarize and the P, P, may, P wave may be completely submerged inside the QRS complex. Sometimes a part of the QRS may be, P may, P may be inside the QRS complex and part may be outside the QRS complex. That also is possible, but uh, maybe inside, uh, sometimes it may be fully inside the QRS complex and no P waves will be seen. Oh, then AV, AVRT, why it is uh, outside the QRS complex? This is because sir, in case of AVRT, sir, the uh, slow pathway of the, uh, uh, sir, uh, uh, one part is AV node and another part, part is accessory pathway. Okay. And in case of AV and RT, the orthodomic variety, the uh, uh, first integrally from the AV node, nodal pathway and retrogradely from the uh, accessory pathway. Okay. As a result, the accessory pathway will take little time for the retrograde conduction. So, the P waves will be visible after the QRS complex. Yeah. See, actually the impulse reaches the accessory pathway only after the ventricle has been uh, depolarized. See, the impulse travels from the uh, through the AV node into the bundle of his depolarized the ventricles, then enters the accessory pathway and then only goes to the atrium. So, already the ventricle is totally depolarized before the impulse reaches the axillary pathway through which it reaches the atrium and the, then the atrium is depolarized. So, the ventricle and the atrium are depolarized uh, one after another. A ventricle is depolarized first and then the impulse has to travel up into the atrium and the atrium is depolarized. So, definitely the P wave in a patient with AVRT is outside the QRS complex. While in a patient with um, uh, 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 AVNRT, it is submerged inside the QRS complex. One. In uh, AV, uh, AVRT, uh, why is it is uh, QRS complex narrow? Why uh, can it be broad also? Then in case of AVRT, yeah. it can find if it is antidromic conduction. Sir. Antidromic conduction. What is the percentage of patients with AVRT having antidromic conduction? So it is less. I don't know the percentage, but it is less. Okay. Sriram? Uh, percentage, I don't know, sir. It's about 10 to 20%. Up to 20% can have anti-grade conduction. Mostly it is retrograde conduction. Why the mostly it is retrograde conduction? Uh, retrograde conduction. Why can't it be rather uh, orthodromic conduction? Why can't it be antidromic conduction? What is the reason? because of the refractory period of the accessory pathway is more. Yeah, very good. The refractive period of the accessory pathway compared to AV, AV node refractive period is more. So the impulse, when an ectopic bit arises, it differentially gets conducted through the AV nodal pathway rather than through the axillary pathway. Unless the impulse arises very close to the axillary pathway and by the time it reaches the AV node, already the axillary pathway has recovered and the impulse could travel down the axillary pathway. That is why usually in a patient with AVRT, uh, about 10 to 20 percent are uh, antidromic conduction and 80 to 90 percent are orthodromic conduction. Okay, right. so okay, sir. it seems sir. that this is a AVRT, very good. Yes. Sir, in a, sorry, sir, in a typical AV and RT, sir, uh, we will get the P wave uh, following QRS complex. We will be able to see P waves in a typical and AV and RT, sir. Yes, yes. What is it? What is it? I didn't go to that. What is a typical AV and RT? Sir, uh, the P waves, uh, P waves will be seen. P waves of the preceding QRS will be seen in front of the next uh, QRS. No, it is it's outside the QRS. See, sometimes, usually, you know, in AV and RT, the P is inside the QRS complex, or maybe just outside the QRS complex, indicating that the RP interval is practically zero or short, and PR okay. interval is quite prolonged. But on the other hand, in patients with atypical AV and RT, sometimes the PR interval can be shorter than RP interval, or it may be equal or the R, the the PO is outside the QRS complex, and what is the what is the explanation? Anybody? Anybody? The atypical uh, AVNRT is fast slow pathway. So yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah I agree with you. you explain it. Two uh, explanations are there. So one is integrally it will be going through the fast pathway. Huh. Retrogradely, it will be go through the slow path. 
Yeah, so that is one explanation that in an in a uh, in an appropriate time timed atrial ectopic beat, sometimes rarely the embryos can travel down the axillary pathway, the fast pathway, and then can go up by the slow pathway. In that case, uh, you can have atypical uh, avian NRT NRT pattern. Second. The, the, normally, you know, the uh, in a patient with uh, supraventricular tachycardia, the supraventricular tachycardia is initiated by a, an ectopic beat, mostly by an atrial ectopic beat. Instead, if the tachycardia is, start, is induced by a ventricular ectopic beat, what can happen is that the, uh, the slow pathway, which has uh, recovered faster, can conduct the embers onto the atrium, and the fast pathway, uh, which has uh, recovered later, can conduct the impulse from atrium to the ventricle, make, making it an atypical AVNRT. So, two mechanisms one, in an appropriately uh, timed uh, atrial ectopic beat, the impulse can travel down the fast pathway and can go up the slow pathway. In the initiating event, is a ventricular ectopic beat. When it reaches the uh, AV node, it may find that the, the slow pathway has recovered while the fast pathway is still refractory. And hence, the embers can travel up the slow pathway into the atrium, and then it can travel down the pathway from atrium to ventricle through the fast pathway. So the, the, these are the two explanations for the atypical AVNRT, where the PO is outside the QRS complex, and sometimes it may be so outside that the RP interval may be longer, uh, long, long, longer than the PR interval. That's very uncommon, but it can happen. So it is something a standard question question of the examiners. You must uh, you must be well, it must be possible for you to give an explanation for such a phenomenon. Okay, any other doubts? Okay, we'll go to the next one. Okay. Because this is not very difficult. Some standard arrhythmias. Uh, it's flutter waves are there. Yeah, flutter. Atrial flutter, yes. A typical flutter, a typical flutter, and what is the difference? Uh, sir, we have to see two, three AVF uh, for flutter. So, uh, uh, if they are so typical flutter, sir. Yeah, it is typical flutter. The yeah, typical yeah. Fl flutter, flutter waves are best seen in lead two, three AVF. That is uh, suggestive of a typical flutter. An atypical flutter. Sir, uh, I think they are positive waves in two, three AVF. That is it. No, the flutter waves can be positive or negative in two, three years, but typical. That depends upon whether it is a clockwise or anti-clockwise conduction. But the atypical flutter, what is atypical flutter? And what is the difference in the, uh, why it is so significant to uh, uh, whether it is a atypical flutter or a typical flutter? Sir, uh, typical uh, involves cable uh, tricuspid isthmus. Very uh, good. Yeah, very good. It is a, the real site is uh, it is in that uh, uh, triangle or, or, or in the in the triangle. And so we can that, ablation uh, for ablation purposes. It is important to recognize. The typical good. will be easy to. Yes, the, the typical one is uh, amenable to uh, ablation. While well, a typical one. Sir, a typical sir, it is uh, we cannot ablate sir. That will be coming from the. So we have to isolate the pulmonary vein. I think sir. In those. You can try that, but usually it has got multiple uh, reentry circuits inside the inside the atrium, maybe in the in the enteral septum or in maybe different parts of the atrium, and hence uh, it is not uh, uh, possible to ablate patients with atypical flutter. So typical flutter. Six block also, sir. So RR interval is six. No, no RR interval is going on varying. So this patient is having a varying conduction. Uh, he has got three to one, four to one conduction. So here, we look at here. 
So, sir, in exam, we have to tell it will flutter with varying block like that. Yes, so, yeah, it will flutter with varying block. What else? That is not enough. It's not complete. Yes, Is it, uh, you are saying uh, it will flutter, typically flutter uh, yeah. with varying block. Yes. Yeah. How do you uh, how, how do you differentiate between atrial flutter and atrial tachycardia? Sometimes atrial tachycardia can have a rate of around 260, 280, and sometimes flutter also can have a rate of around 260, 280. So when they overlap, what will be the point for you to make a diagnosis that this is a flutter and not a tachycardia? Flutter waves uh, in uh, uh, the varying undulations. Are they, they are not at uh, I, uh, they they undulate around the isoelectric uh, line. Yeah. Uh, in a flutter, in a flutter, there is no isoelectric line. Usually, uh, no. it goes up and up. Uh, uh, there are there are uh, uh, flutter waves and uh, depolarization and repolarization re waves. While in atrial tachycardia, there will be in between. You will be able to see isoelectric line. So in a in a arrhythmia strip, if you are seeing a bit of a iso iso uh, uh, isoelectric uh, interval, then you should go for atrial tachycardia. And if there is no isoelectric interval at all, and it's all uh, going up and down, then that goes that goes in for atrial flutter. Okay. What else is there in this patient? So there is a myocardial infarction, sir. Yeah, and this patient has got evidence of a. Uh, a recent myocardial infarction looks ST is still remaining elevated, and there are Q waves in V1, V2, V3, and also V4 with ST elevation. So it is a recent anterior myocardial infarction, which is the cause for atrial. Okay. So you sir, should. Sir, sir, yes. Sorry, sir. Sir, oh. sorry, sir. Sorry, sir. In such cases, sir, if uh, we have irregular rhythms are like this, and sometimes a coarse fibrillation also, we get confused. Sir, is there uh, something we should? Uh, uh, how to sometimes differentiate is difficult, sir. That it is whether it is flutter, uh, coarse fibrillation or uh, flutter with varying conduction. Sir. Uh, we see uh, electrocardiogram, there, there is no difficulty because you can see the flutter waves and which can be easily recognized, and there is no problem. Sometimes, okay. when the when the atrial flutter is with the very uh, varying uh, uh, AV conduction, sometimes it is impossible to differentiate from the atrial flutter. That is why irregularly irregular rhythm. Uh, sorry, atrial fibrillation or irregularly irregular rhythm. One of the uh, differential diagnoses of atrial fibrillation is atrial flutter with varying block. So sometimes there can be a difficulty. But if you are in the neck, if you are seeing some oscillations which is suggestive of uh, uh, a high frequent, high, high frequent, uh, uh, high, large number of oscillations, sometimes it may be possible for you to suspect atrial flutter. Okay. But uh, I think you should not commit. Because atrial flutter with varying block, sometimes clinically it is extremely difficult to differentiate from uh, atrial fibrillation. And uh, atrial flutter with varying Can you tell me a few uh, examples of irregularly irregular rhythm? Causes of irregularly irregular rhythm? One is atrial Multi fibrillation. What else? Multi Multifocal atrial tachycardia. Sir. Very good. Um, Multiple ectopics. Multiple ectopics. Very good. Aortic atrial rhythm. Varying ventricular block. With, uh, varying ventricular block means, I mean. What do you mean by that? Ventricular uh, tachycardia with variable retrograde conduction. What do you mean by that? Ventricular tachycardia with a variable retrograde conduction. What, what do you mean by that? You please explain your statement. Uh, uh, but if it is one is to one conduction, then we will get uh, the regular. Oh. Uh, Regular what? That is the canon wave. Sorry. Hmm. Any other cause? You see, I think there are a few examples of multiple uh, atrial fibrillation, atrial flutter with varying block, uh, multiple ectopics, atrial or ventricular, ventricular, chaotic atrial rhythm, wandering pacemaker. And uh, uh, multifocal uh, atrial tachycardia. These are all examples of irregularly irregular rhythm. But any time when you find a patient with irregularly irregular rhythm, always go for atrial fibrillation. 
Only if the examiner asks for you asks about the differential diagnosis, then only you should discuss the differential diagnosis. Always your diagnosis in a patient with irregularly irregular rhythm is atrial fibrillation. And then electrocardiogram can definitely differentiate between uh, atrial fibrillation with other arrhythmias. Okay, right. We'll go to the next one. Sir, this is a 12-lead uh, standard ECG, which is uh, showing uh, sinus tachycardia uh, oh. with a, PR, a short PR interval of, uh, I think, less than 120. And hmm. uh, there is, uh, uh, there is uh, I think, 2-3 AVF has uh, delta waves in the ascending limbs. Uh, I'm not sure, but there is some uh, evidence of free excitation, as well as the, in V1, there is a QR complex. Mm, uh, and uh, uh, there is evidence of R, um, RVH, RV strain patterns. Uh, Why are you saying all these diagnoses? What is the evidence of RVH? There, um, R by, um, there is, is S wave in V6. Or, or is it a small R, uh, small R, S and R dash pattern? No, it's not RSR pattern. It's uh, QR. If you, look, if you look at it as you go to these leaves, let me see whether I can show you. Do you think that here, here there is an R wave, small R wave? No, that is Q, sir. Q for me. Is it, a, is it preceding Q? Is there a small R wave? Here also there is a small R wave. Okay, okay, so. Can you see? It seems that it is more of an RSR dash pattern than QR pattern. Yes. Any other any other uh, differential diagnosis or anybody else would like to uh, think differently? The axis is uh, hundred ten. Okay, axis. Uh, um, uh, not hundred. Uh, so near about. Uh, uh, see, AVR is uh, uh, negative. Sir, AVL is negative also. Sir. AVL is also negative. Uh, lead one also is negative. So what would be the axis? Sir, more than ninety, sir. Uh, the transition is between lead one, lead one, and AVR. So it will be around 90, Okay, right. There is some degree of axis towards the right, right axis deviation. Well taken. There is RSR dash pattern. Yes, what else? What is, is there an arrhythmia? Yes, sir. It looks like the two is to one. Uh, uh, the periods are uh, same uh, twice, sir. Uh, what is, the, what is the morphology of the PA in lead to? It's negative and can you see two? Uh, see here is a, here is a uh, P wave, here is a P wave with a rate of around? 300. 300. It's a rate of around 300 with no isoelectric line. So what is the uh, possibility? Atrial? Flutter with two, three is two. The atrial flutter with two is to one block. And right axis deviation R SAR dash pattern. So, what is the diagnosis? Yes. Is it uh, Epstein, sir? Yes, sir. No. No, no, no. It is. No, no. Sir. Yes, sir. Epstein is there. Right axis deviation with R SAR dash pattern and all. Or do you think that this could be atrial septal defect? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Atrial septal defect patients can have atrial arrhythmias. And so this is a two-ish one block. You should carefully look for it because there's a two-ish one block in a patient with, a, uh, you can see this is a P wave, uh, rather a flutter wave. And this is a two-ish one flutter wave, uh, two-ish one atrial flutter. See, whenever the heart rate is around 150 constant or when the heart rate is 75 constant, you should always look for atrial flutter. Because atrial flutter, uh, uh, 
can have a constant two is to one conduction that will give rise to 150 heart rate it can have four is to one conduction it will give rise to 75 heart rate so whenever you even on your clinical examination heart rate is 75 exactly 75 or if the heart rate is exactly 150 always consider a possibility of atrial flutter because it is in atrial flutter that you get a constant 150 heart rate and constant 75 heart rate very often the uh, the flutter rate is about 300 and 2 is to 1 or 4 is to 1 conduction is the commonest conduction pattern in atrial flutter and so they can have a heart rate of 150 or 75 so whenever the heart rate is constant 150 on clinical examination 150 clinical examination 75 you always think of a possibility of atrial flutter also sir uh, can pulmonary embolism be a possibility in this case sir pulmonary embolism uh, well if you want to discuss pulmonary embolism you can have but the pulmonary embolism atrial flutter of course it can happen they can have atrial fibrillation uh, atrial flutter also can happen because of the sudden rise in the atrial pressure can sometimes give rise to atrial atrial fibrillation so so atrial flutter that's quite possible but uh, 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 chronic arrhythmia i think we should uh, think of a possibility of atrial septal defect as the first one we can definitely discuss the possibility of uh, of uh, atrial uh, pulmonary embolism giving rise to all these problems but usually in a patient with pulmonary embolism uh, right axis deviation not very common because okay. there, is, uh, there is no time for the for the patient to develop right axis deviation okay sir Sir, in this QR pattern in V1 is uh, P uh, means uh, pH. We should also consider a no? systemic pH. Uh, I I th- I thought it was a small R. Uh, okay, S- okay, sir. S- ah, yes, sir, yes, sir. You can. Okay, next one. in it case somebody would like to volunteer to discuss the ecg ranjan would you like to try ranjan where are you from i saw your name where are you from ranjan any volunteers vasisht would you like to try eganath anybody who would like to volunteer i, I think you should develop the habit of uh, try, uh, taking up the challenge because this is not an examination it hardly matters whether they you made a mistake or not but if you try to interpret repeatedly that will give you a lot of confidence to face the examination so try to do it i i find that uh, sadhguru over a period of time has developed so much confidence so that uh, that is a Uh, that's a good sign that she has been attempting to interpret anything so that the confidence will uh, steadily grow and ultimately you will become an expert anybody who would like to take up the challenge otherwise we will ask saroj also to try again saroj why can't you try try yes sir uh, sir uh... This this is we show white QRS complex. Very good. Sir, it is of left bundle branch block morphology. Very good. Sir, axis is left axis. Okay. And sir, uh, in a in a left bundle branch block pattern, if there is left axis deviation, what does it mean? Uh, sir, uh, 
LVH. Yes, very good. People have thought that uh, it is one of the uh, indicators of LVH in presence of left ventricular flow. Another indicator of LVH? Sir, in LVBB. Oh. Oh. One, 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 you have already mentioned that in a left axis deviation, it may indicate LVH. Second? Sir, uh, QRS complex more than uh, 45. Uh, total QRS complex. Uh, no, sir. Uh, I mean, S in uh, V1 plus R in V6 more than 45 uh, in presence of LBBB. Okay. The criteria applied for electronic hypertrophy can also be applied. But another criteria, somebody was telling about the, what about the width of the QRS complex? QRS, sir, QRS duration more than 140 millisecond, I think, sir. It is 150. People have said 150. Because in a standard LBBB, sometimes you can get, get up to 140. So if it is uh, 150 or more, that usually indicates associated uh, LBBB with left, left ventricular hypertrophy. Okay, right. Yes. Go ahead, uh, Saroj. Sir, uh, sir, each QRS complex is preceded by P waves as P means the lead V1. Hmm. Uh, and sir, PR interval uh, seems to be normal. Okay. There is a rhythm strip. You should look at the rhythm strip V1 also. Lower there is a rhythm strip. Ah, sir. Lower rhythm strip is seen, sir. Sir, hmm. uh, 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 there is a PR interval is sir, normal, sir. Okay. Very good. Yeah. And sir, uh, in the uh, terminal part of the QRS in V1, sir, some notching is there. Uh, yeah. Where is the notching? Uh, in the V1 sir, rhythm strip, hmm. terminal part of the QRS. Hmm. Sir, in uh, all the all the complexes, we can see some. Uh, sir, why, uh, the the uh, slurred S wave is some not seen. Okay, what is it due to? So that may be due to fragmentation, sir. Hmm. Uh, more sir, like more likely than fragmentation. Fragmentation. Yeah. P wave may be buried, sir. Yeah. Do you think it is a P wave? Sir, it's uh, looking more like IV. Type. Hmm? Like conduction defect type of it. What conduction defect? Uh, Intraven. If, if you have got a doubt, see, you are seeing something here. See, there is some notch here. So if you have got a, if you feel there is a notch here, if you want to make out whether it's a P or not, what will you do? You should measure the distance from here to here and here to here. So it has to be same. If it is the same, then you should think that it is a P wave. It is the same. So this is a two is to one? Yes, sir. Two is to one block. Is two is to one block. So what is the full diagnosis? Sir, so, uh, sir uh, this is, sir, uh, uh, two is to one. Oh, maybe okay. this to, um, QRS checking uh, left bundle branch block morphology. Don't, don't, why do you want to say that QRS taking left bundle branch Left bundle branch block. Don't, don't, don't use the word QRS taking a left bundle branch block morphology. Do you, do you have any other diagnosis for that morphology? No, sir. No. So you should say that the ECG is showing left bundle branch block, two east one block. What else? And sir, also. So, sir, the, this LVH, sir, because left axis is there. Oh, that is uh, that is not 100%. You can, if you want, if the examiner asks you, you can discuss uh, the pre presence of a left axis deviation in a patient with left uh, bundle branch block. You sure you can indicate L LVH. Yes, that can be discussed. Anything else? Sir, there is, sir, uh, uh, in that least two, three area, sir, there is, uh, 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 sir, fragmentation in the the uh, beginning of the QRS complex. Sir. Yeah, there's some fragmentation. Okay. More important than that, what, what is happening in uh, at least V2, V2 to V6? Sir. There is ST. Coving and uh, ST coving and PU inversion. And also presence of a in LBBB. Can you get a QA when we find V6? Sir, Garbo no. yeah, yeah. So there's a QA in uh, uh, V5 and V6. Mm. There's a problem in RV in V1. All in intraventricular. No, sir. Am I? Patient has got a previous myocardial oh, infarction, yeah. or it could be a evolving anterior myocardial infarction. 
So this patient has got left ventral branch block, two eastern block, and evolving anterior wall myocard infarction. Three point three things. Sir, it's not typical LBBV, na? Because V five V six has Q. So V five V six presents of Q is uh, the one which they tell you that the patient has developed a myocard infarction. Oh. So slurring in yeah. AVL uh, is it important that like <clears throat> it is part of the LBBV itself or should we consider this as a uh, 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 sir, seen event of MI in this case, sir. Like, yes, you can uh, you can that consider that. That may only indicate uh, uh, evolving myocardial infarction. Fragmentation can be discussed. Okay. Any other point? Sir, so that uh, sign was there, na no? notching in V three V four S wave. Okay. Camera or something, which is suggestive of old MI. So, so that is that the sign, yes, sir. In yeah, yeah, yeah. There's a uh, see. Uh, you read about the uh, various features which will tell you that patient when a patient with LBBB, how can you diagnose previous myocardial infarction? Why is it that uh, in RBBB you can always diagnose myocardial infarction, but in LBBB there is a difficulty in my uh, diagnosing myocardial infarction? Why it is so? Because discordance is there between the ST and T. Uh, there is. Uh, opposite so that no no that's not the reason why it is that you are able to diagnose my previous myocardial infarction in a in patients with right bundle branch block why in patients with left bundle branch block you have got a difficulty why it is so sir so this is because of the septal activation sir hmm. what do you mean by that sir in uh, sir uh, septal activation sir normally is from uh, first to the right oh If you look at the right bundle branch block pattern, which part of the QRS complex is uh, altered? Initial part. Of. Eh? In right bundle branch. No, block? no, no, sir. Uh, uh, in in initial in right bundle branch block pattern, the initial part of the QRS complex is normal. While the second later part of the QRS complex is terminal part is uh, terminal part is altered. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. In a patient with uh, uh, LBBB, initial part of the initial as well as terminal both terminal. are affected. In a patient with myocardial infarction, in a patient with myocardial infarction, in a patient with myocardial infarction, what is the evidence of infarction? Q. Ah, yes, you are right. Q wave. Q wave. Q wave is it a uh, is a is a early event or a terminal event? Early event. Early event. So in a patient with right bundle branch block, the early part of the QRS is not altered. So when the patient occurs, when the myocardial infarction occurs, which is uh, uh, detected by alteration in the QRS morphology in the initial part of the QRS morphology, it can be easily diagnosed. But in the patient with the left ventral branch block, the initial as well as uh, later half of the QRS complex is altered in left ventral branch block, and the initial portion can be altered in uh, myocardial infarction. So, in a patient with the LBBB, the initial part of the QRS complex can be altered both by LBBB as well as by uh, myocardial infarction. So, hence, in presence of LBBB, there is a difficulty in diagnosing previous myocardial infarction. There are few points. Another sign. Uh, we'll uh, we'll discuss that uh, 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 the the diagnosis of uh, my, uh, previous myocardial infarction in presence of left ventral branch block. There are about ten twelve points uh, to diagnose uh, the uh, the uh, the uh, presence of a previous myocardial infarction in presence in presence of left ventral branch block. Here we we have got few points here. One presence of a Q wave in V five and V six. Presence of an R wave in V1, presence of a Q wave in AVL, presence of a Q wave in lead one. All these are points to suspect that patient may be having uh, a pre previous myocardial infarction. Normally, in left front branch block, we don't expect Q waves in V5 and V6, and prominent R wave in V1 also is not there. So, if these things are there, those are points uh, which may make us suspect that the patient may be having uh, associated uh, myocardial infarction. So, you you look up the how to diagnose. I got infarction in the sense of a left front branch block. We will discuss in the one in one of the sessions. Okay. Any any other doubts?
So this is a two is to one block. Okay. Diagnosis. Sir, this is a 12 lead standard ECG, which is showing uh, a rate of around 100 uh, PR interval of short PR, sir, uh, around 100 millisecond. Then there is. Uh, uh, Why did you say PR is short? Because here, you see, if you look at the PR here. Ah, here it is. Okay. In rhythm strip, rhythm strip, it is appearing. Oh, yeah, yeah. Rhythm strip is short. Okay, okay right. And uh, there is a STT uh, depression in 2-3 AVF uh, with uh, T inversions in 1 and AVL. And uh, there is T inversion in uh, V3 to V6. V3 to uh, V4, V5, V6. Okay, yes. What is the duration of okay. ST segment? Uh, what is the duration the of prolonged it? QT, sir? Prolonged QT and mostly ST segment is prolonged. prolonged. Uh, what, what are the conditions in which ST segment can be prolonged? Prolonged. QT prolongation. QT prolongation. Long QT syndrome. Okay. Uh, sir, there are some drugs which can cause, like for amoidarone. Okay. Mm, sir, some amitriptyline. Uh, sir, uh, uh, antihistamines. Okay, uh, what uh, what is sir, the group uh, one, can, class you think, one can you think of the conditions where uh, the the QT the ST segment prolongation is more pronounced than the actual QT prolongation? Uh, what is the duration of the ST segment normally? QT what? is less than four six T. 0.36 to 0.44 is the QT and uh, ST is ST from the start. So it's 0.2. 300. Uh, sir, QT, uh, sir, ST should be half of the RR internet. <laughs> what is the corrected? So, so well, let us go for corrected QT interval. The corrected QT is a QT divided by root over RR internet. Okay. And so what is, is the different. what is the duration of the QT in corrected QT interval normal upper limit? 0. 0.44. Okay, 0. 0.44. That's very good. 0. 0.44. And uh, uh, what is the duration of the ST segment? Let's see, we have to look. So 80 millisecond, one up to 120, 80 millisecond. If we do uh, minus, that will be. Hmm? And sir, it will be around 300. The ST segment is 300? No, sir. Sir, we don't know. No, from start of S to start of T, so it will be short. So around 200. Anybody? It's usually from 50 to 150 milliseconds. 50 to 150 milliseconds. So if, if the uh, ST segment is uh, uh, four small squares, it is abnormal. It becomes 160. And uh, one of the condition which there can be ST prolongation is, uh, the ST is prolonged is ischemia. Uh, another is uh, uh, patients with hypocalcemia. Patients with hypocalcemia and ischemia can have ST segment prolongation. Is this patient having any an arrhythmia? Do you think that there is an abnormality here? Is there abnormality here? Mm. It's a, yes, sir, rhythm. No, no, there's a PVA here. This another PVA is described just before T, sir. Yeah, what is this? Sir, another PVA is described just before T, sir. 
Hmm. Yeah, this is a this is an ectopic P wave, and what is happening to that P wave? It is not conducting. It is non conducting. The patient is having a blocked atrial ectopics. Or alternating beats are actually every be every beat is followed by an early ectopic atrial ectopic beat, which is getting blocked. And as you rightly described, there is evidence of ischemia, as evidenced by prolongation of the ST segment, and also T wave inversion in uh, V2, V3, and V4. Also, there are some ST changes seen in D2, 3 wave also. So, all put together, there's evidence of ischemia with uh, 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 blocked atrial ectopics. Sir, in type 3 long QT syndrome, also, sir, uh, mainly, sir, ST segment is prolonged, not yes, the T in, in, in QT prolongation, you can get ST segment prolongation, definitely. But I wanted to. Uh, impress upon you that sometimes ST segment prolongation may be one important uh, uh, electrocardiographic abnormality. Uh, sometimes QT prolongation may not be too much. So, when ST prolongation is significant, more than 100, 150, 200, something like that, then the conditions that you should suspect are hypocalcemia and ischemia. Okay, what is this uh, X-ray? Is this you have already seen? Uh, chest X-ray uh, PA view, which is uh, uh, showing uh, there is uh, no cardiomegaly, sir. Okay. Uh, there is enlargement uh, uh, of uh, RA as it is occupying more than uh, um, pre intercostal space. And oh, uh, it, I don't know whether this you can. See, it's about one, two, not two and a half. Two and a half. No, no, it is not there. I want to agree with you that there's a right atrial enlargement. Okay, right here. Yes. Yes. There is no cardiomegaly. There is yes. no, uh, no significant chamber enlargement which could be detected by a plain X-ray. Right. And okay. uh, there is alveolar edema, sir. There is like uh, bat wings uh, appearance. Significant yes. PVH is there, sir. Uh, no, no, is what, what is this appearance? Uh, what is this appearance to do? What is this appearance due to? Significant PV stenosis, stenosis, uh, significant PVH, alveolar edema. Oh, you can say permanent edema. Why do you want to say alveolar edema? Ah, ah, yes, it, is alveoli, it, is, it indicates permanent edema. Yes. Okay, yes. There is a valve is seen. Yeah, so what is so? so, so that is a so, mitral valve most probably. Yeah, so if there is a valve and there is permanent edema, what is your diagnosis? Mitral stenosis. Mitral stenosis. Mitral stenosis. Mitral stenosis. Mm. Mitral stenosis. Prostatic valve is there. Uh, and prostatic valve dysfunction. The, yeah, what type of dysfunction? Stuck wall. Thrombosis. Due to what? It's a thrombosis. Thrombosis. And thrombosis. Prostatic that's the first diagnosis because this patient is presented with acute pulmonary edema. And uh, <coughs> when the valve is there, you should think of the possibility of prostatic valve thrombosis. Prostatic valve thrombosis, yes, sir. What is the management? Uh, thrombolysis. Why? It, de it depends yes, on uh, hemodynamic status of the patient, sir. Oh, yes. If it is uh, if it is class three and four, mm -hmm. uh, and if there are no contraindications to surgery, then a surgery should be uh, done. If it yeah. is uh, class one or two and the patient is relatively uh, stable, uh, then um, uh, we should check uh, for the INR and is uh, whatever anticoagulation he or she was taking. And uh, if uh, if th that is, then either we can uh, uh, in uh, either we can uh, thrombolyze the patient or we can increase the dose of the anticoagulation depending on the. Okay. If the, if the what is the problem of uh, thrombolytic therapy in these patients? The thromboembolism, sir. Thro thromboembolism. Systemic embolism. Sir. Why? Sir, because the size of the thrombus is important, sir. If ten centimeter and above. Then we have to go for surgery. Yes, uh, very good. I think that's most nowadays the uh, um, uh, most of the uh, most of the recommendation is that patients with uh, significant uh, wall uh, prostatic valve thrombosis actually we should recommend uh, surgical treatment because the thrombolytic therapy can result in uh, lysis of the clot, partial lysis of the clot, and part of the clot may get dislodged and may result in a, a massive cerebral embolism. I had recently one patient who had, uh, uh, but uh, not recently, about two years ago, 
patient came with uh, uh, acute valve thrombosis because uh, she wanted to become pregnant and she discontinued anticoagulation of her own and she developed acute valve thrombosis and uh, the uh, the surgeon was not willing to take up the patient because she was acutely sick could not she was in acute pulmonary edema and the patient uh, was given thrombolytic therapy and she quickly improved her uh, breathlessness came down everything improved and on the third day she developed a massive cerebral embolism and we lost her so this is one complication you should always think in your think of uh, keep in your mind that when you are giving thrombolytic therapy there is an always a risk that it may result in a systemic embolism and uh, that may be catastrophic so the general recommendation is that if surgery surgery is possible and surgeon is uh, uh, ready to take up the patient i think that is the first treatment if that is not possible then you can give thrombolytic therapy okay yes and you have if the patient is mildly symptomatic i think you have got option because then it obviously means that probably by uh, giving uh, parenteral anticoagulation sometimes these patients can settle down so that can be evaluated whether the uh, thrombus burden how long is the, how much is the thrombus burden if the thrombus burden is heavy i think the correct treatment is to do to recommend surgical treatment okay uh, this uh, the uh, the pressure tracing diagnosis you have three tracings uh, lv tracing aortic aortic tracing and la tracing there it is uh, the gradient is seen between the left ventricle and aorta yeah there is a gradient between the aorta and the lv due to what the possibly the fixed obstruction fixed obstruction okay what about others no sir it doesn't seem fixed because there will be delayed uh, peaking in uh, aortic stenosis fixed obstruction it's hmm. more looking like there is no delay uh, there is no delayed peaking and it's more looking like spike and dome uh, okay you think that it is what, what, what do you mean by spike and dome i mean hocm sir hypertrophic uh, sub aortic level sir okay you are thinking it is it's a so you cannot use the word subaortic level subaortic also can be dynamic as well as fixed Uh, sir, I mean HOCM, the dynamic obstruction of the LV. Okay, okay, right. Yes. See, uh, Saroj, you are look at here. See what is happening to the uh, see to the uh, when the pressure in the LV rises. What happens to aortic pressure? Yes, sir. What happens? Sir, here, sir, uh, in the aorta also, sir, it has uh, increased, sir. Yeah, the the aortic pressure is going. Uh, the aortic pressure is going up along with the LV pressure. LV pressure. So uh, at this stage there is no. Sir, no gradient. Sir. No obstruction. Yes, obstruction. No. Then suddenly the obstructions come. So it is a dynamic obstruction. Yes, so in dynamic obstruction, initial part of the pressure curve of the aorta will move along with the left ventricular pressure curve, and then as the obstruction sets in, then there will be gradient. So this is a dynamic obstruction. The dynamic of if it is a fixed obstruction, the gradient will be from the early part of the LV. As soon as the uh, the LV pressure crosses over the aortic pressure, there will be a gradient. The gradient will be as somebody has pointed out. There will be delayed. It goes up, up and up. The peak is delayed, and the closure also is delayed. So this is a, a dynamic obstruction of the and then the LV pressure. Yes, sir. Here the LV pressure is also high, sir. Yeah, LV pressure is high. Which which one is high? Which wave is high? V wave is high. V wave. So the patient is having associated MR. Mitral regurgitation. MR. MR. So this this is a patient of dynamic obstruction, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy with mitral regurgitation. You must. Know, this is the point for you to differentiate. When the uh, aortic pressure rises with the LV pressure initially, then an obstruction occurs. It suggests you have dynamic obstruction. In a patient with fixed obstruction, the, from the beginning. There will be gradient between the aortic pressure and the LV pressure, and there will be delayed closure of the aortic valve. Sir, had it not been MR, then A wave will be prominent. Ah, huh? alone HOCM uh, will A wave must have. No, A wave can A wave A wave can be prominent. I agree with you that because of the no the reduced compliance of the LA. LV LV increase LV ED LV. This is the uh, echo of a patient with acute myocardial infarction on day two. 
sir uh, AM, AML is sir chordae rupture yeah there's a rupture of the chordae and the patient is having severe severe mr mr so this is on the usually the chordal rupture occurs uh, uh, by about 36 to 40 hours later and the patients will present with acute what is the presentation sir acute pulmonary pulmonary edema, edema. Yeah, they present with acute pulmonary edema why the pulmonary edema sir because la is not compliant and sir so much of regurgitation yes, for pulmonary condition non non compliant la and the regurgitation will result in acute rise in the la pressure and the patient can go in for acute pulmonary edema what is the presentation of patients with uh, uh, vst sir hypovolemic shock yeah they go for shock stage uh, hypotension shock and right heart failure is a feature of uh, uh, intraventricular septal rupture while acute pulmonary edema uh, uh, is a feature of patients with uh, acute papillary muscle rupture or partial papillary muscle rupture with acute mitral regurgitation and when you look at the uh, uh, lv the, uh, the contraction of the lv will be usually very good it is the papillary muscle rupture which results in uh, actually it is a powerful contraction yeah, maybe some one reason for these patients to go in for papillary muscle rupture and uh, they can develop acute mitral regurgitation and what will be the clinical finding uh, so there will be sir uh, um, systolic murmur but it will be sir uh, not pan systolic sir ंगलर <laughs> Free wall rupture will give rise to a murmur. No, no, sir. If there is a murmur audible in a patient with a acute myocardial infarction to at the towards the apex, and sometimes associated with a thrill, what is your diagnosis? Yes, sir. And you is no. It is a ventricular yes, septal rupture near the apex. The muscular intraventricular septal rupture. the endoventricular septal rupture uh, near the apex which can give rise to a long systolic murmur very loud and sometimes may be even associated with a systolic thrill but usually papillary muscle rupture when the patient will be acutely symptomatic the murmur will be very short very faint sometimes you may not be able to detect any murmur because the patient is acutely sick and uh, uh, echocardiogram will give you the correct diagnosis why is it that the murmur of mitral regurgitation acute mitral regurgitation is only early systolic and not mid or late systolic because, because of the la pressure, pressure rises fast yeah because of the uh, equalization non compliant uh, uh, left atrium as soon as the regurgitation gross regurgitation of case into the left atrium the la pressure significantly rises and may get almost equal to that of the lv pressure and the, the mitral regurgitation almost ceases so in patients with the papillary muscle rupture uh, the usual no prominent murmurs are audible if you are hearing a prominent murmur go for vst now the uh, pa- acute papillary muscle rupture usually if at all can give rise to a short early systolic murmur very often that also is not audible no murmurs are audible most of the times Okay, diagnosis. The symbol. Tamponade. Cardiac tamponade. How will you diagnose? How will you diagnose cardiac tamponade? Sir, uh, severe pericardial effusion with uh, uh, diastolic collapse of uh, uh, RV and RA. Sir, RV is more specific. Okay. And uh, in which phase of diastolic did they collapse? Sir, early diastolic uh, collapse of RV and late diastolic collapse of RA. Yeah. Uh, uh, why it is like that? You look for early diastolic collapse of RV and uh, late diastolic collapse of RA. Why? 
it is on the filling sir uh, mm-hmm. there is a uh, only systolic filling is there in actually cardiac tamponade mm-hmm. so um, um, in early diastole sir uh, um, i mean um, what is hemodynamics of uh, these uh, two findings one early diastole collapse of rv and late diastole collapse of rv Uh, sir i mean uh, the in cardiac tamponade the blood can enter uh, the heart only when it empties so that happens only in systole uh, so i mean uh, there is systolic filling uh, in systolic filling is there uh, normally it's with uh, which chamber is filled with blood in systole atria atrium atria dilates and uh, receives the blood from the corresponding veins Uh, when is the uh, pressure lowest in right ventricle when is the pressure lowest in uh, right ventricle so, uh, isovolumetric at the, relaxation period uh, at the end of isovolumetric relaxation yes at the end of the isovolumetric relaxation period when the uh, lv rv pressure is uh, lowest so it is an early diastole that the rv pressure is lowest and hence the compression effect of the pericardial pressure is best detected in the early diastole in right ventricle while where which is the lowest pressure in the uh, right atrium after y wave sir after y uh, y descent means is it during early diastole or uh, during late diastole sir? late diastole sir late because diastole. it uh, yeah. when it empties and yes the rv has emptied into the right, right ventricle and the pressure in the rv drops in the late diastole and so that is the time when you can get the rv collapse so the uh, uh, sorry uh, rv collapse uh, so rv collapse is early diastolic and rv collapse is late diastolic so this is and also you should be able to the swinging movement of the heart as well as large amount of pericardial effusion will tell you that the patient is having cardiac tamponade so this is uh, for uh, vein uh, ivc tracings and you must tell me what is the pressure ra pressure 1 2 3 4 So, sir, first tracing is IVC dilated, but it is having a respiratory phasic variation. So, it is, uh, I think, more than two point one, but uh, more than fifty percent respiratory variation. Yes. So, the pressure. Yeah, no, no, normal. What is the normal variation? Normal is more than fifty. You're wrong. Would you like to correct it? What is the normal respiratory variation? Eighty percent. Eighty percent. Two third. Two third. Huh? Thirty percent. No, no, it's only twenty percent. Normal respiratory variation is twenty percent. What is fifty percent? Uh, with with sniff, uh, yeah. uh, with sniff we do. Uh, with we ask the patient to sniff and then. If uh, do with sniffing, it is fifty percent or more. Mm. Okay. With no, normal respiratory variation is twenty percent. With sniffing, it is fifty percent or more. Well, sniffing is a quick, rapid inspiration, which can result in collapse of the IVC, and which should be fifty percent or more. While well, normal respiratory collapse is only around twenty percent. Okay, right? Yes. So uh, then the pressure the is around fifteen to twenty. Uh, yeah. So, yeah. Okay. Right. Yes. Uh, then the uh, so in the in the the first one the the right atrial pressure uh, must be near normal. The so first one will have elevated, na IVC is dilated, but so uh, mild elevation will be there. But can you see the normal collapse? I will show you the IVC. You cannot measure the IVC. The the measurement can be done in. Ah, uh, M mode should be there. Here is M mode. It is one only. No, one one point nine, sir. It is dilated. Yeah. One point nine. One point nine is dilated. No, no, up to two, two point more than two point one. More two up to two is definitely normal. Even up to two point one is normal. It should be beyond two point one for you to say it is dilated. Okay, right? Yes.
that is the first one. So what about the other ones? Second one, uh, it is having less than fifty uh, percent respiratory variation. Eh? Uh, I mean, respiratory variation is low. Respiratory variation is low. What do you mean by that? Actually, in second and third, in the third one especially. I mean, sir, hypovolemia. Yeah, hypovolemia because. Ah, uh, ICU is collapsed. Uh, third uh, one is ICU. Completely collapsed. So it is a, a patient is in hypovolemia and patient may be in hypovolemic shock and right atrial pressure can be as low as zero to five zero, zero to five zero zero to two or zero to three sometimes can be zero and the fourth one so dilated and not collapsing not collapsing more than twenty pressure pressure more than twenty no no more than twenty more than fifteen fifteen more than fifteen. So the right atrial pressure is more than fifteen. So here it is normal, maybe five to ten. These two are significantly uh, the IVC is collapsing, so it could be zero to three. And this is uh, uh, dilated with uh, no uh, respiratory collapse, so the right atrial pressure can be anywhere above fifteen millimeters of mercury. So you, in every patient coming with uh, uh, shock state, you must always interrogate the IVC to make it certain that it is not hypovolemic shock. Hypovolemic shock is a situation where if it is recognized promptly, can be completely reversible. It's completely reversible. How to approach in intubated patients in IVC, sir? Oh, in intubated patients, there is always a problem, especially if there is a peep and all. There is always a problem. There is a difficulty. So, but then you have to go and look for other features. So, hypovolemic shock uh, patients uh, needing intubation is not very common. Usually, in a, uh, if you can recognize it promptly, uh, the patient may not require any intubation at all. So, intubated in patient, there is always a limitation. If a gynecological patient, sometimes are uh, hypervolemia or that also they are con considering, sir. In that case, we are uh, sometimes not uh, uh, very much uh, confident in giving them IVC directed and less than 50% collapse because we are not sure in intubated and pregnant patients, uh, postnatal patients also. It should be. I agree with you. There is always a difficulty in an intubated patient uh, because, uh, especially if the patient is having a peep, a peep also, that, that will add up to the uh, IVC pressure. And sometimes you may not be able to uh, uh, detect. But of course, with experience, sometimes you may be able to predict that this patient may be having hypovolemia. And in case of doubt, it is better to give fluid and see whether the IVC is getting more and more distended or if the pressure is coming up. There can be a therapeutic challenge. Right, right. Okay. Thank you, sir. Okay. Oh, sorry, this is not moving. Okay, we'll not go for this, not moving. Okay, tell me where are the cathedrals? And what is the cathedral? What is the type of cathedral and where are the cathedrals? Sir, one uh, is uh, through uh, right femoral artery uh, into the, uh, that pigtail catheter is into the, uh, through right femoral artery into the uh, uh, descending arch and then into the aorta and LV. Okay. And uh, then one more catheter is in, uh, uh, through IVC, RA, RV. Okay. Where is it part? Where is the cathedral part? R R V I think. Yeah. Where is this cathedral? Is it in R V or do you think uh, that it is somewhere else? Where is this cathedral? P A sir. Eh? It is in P A and from P A where has it gone to? Wedge. Yeah, yes, it has gone to wedge position. Very good. What do you mean by wedge position? Sir, wedge, uh, 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 sir. Uh, uh, here, sir, we take, uh, sir, uh, um, catheter uh, uh, where the zeroing will come, sir. There will be no. Uh, uh, sir, it will show uh, the pressure of the distance of the. Um, sir, wherever the uh, the tip is, we will be measuring the pressure distal 
to that uh, chamber, sir. And okay. here, the, when, the, when, when you are going, you are reaching in a pulmonary artery wet pressure, you will get the pulmonary venous pressure, and indirectly you will get the left atrial pressure. How will you make out in the in the cath lab that the the, the catheter is actually wedged? Sir, pulmonary it will not move, sir. It will be fixed. Fixed one two. Sir, then uh, the waveforms will change to A and B like, uh, instead of pulmonary yes. artery waveform. The pulmonary artery waveform will change to venous form three. And sir, saturation. Sir, saturation improved. will be hundred percent. You suck the blood, and you will get hundred percent saturation. And also, you can see some respiratory variation of the pulmonary uh, venous pressure, while pulmonary artery pressure will not change with the respiration. Very good. So, for three points are important. One, the 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 catheter tip is fixed. One. Two, uh, the arterial pressure wave pattern will move to change yeah. venous pressure pattern. And three, the, if, when you withdraw blood, you get 100% oxygenated blood. And you can also look at the respiratory variation. When the catheter is wedged, we will have respiratory variation. Okay, very good. Okay, uh, this is a, a hemodynamic data interpret. And also, you, know, you must tell me how to calculate right, right left shunt, left right shunt. And pulmonary vascular resistance. But tell me how to do it. I will start. Okay, right. If you want, you can start. Yes. Uh, sir, uh, uh, first I am going from the sir, oximetry data. Okay. Uh, sir, here the LSVC is 61%. Uh, sir, so it means, sir, uh, uh, it is, uh, the venous return is okay. Sir, patient not in hypovolemia or like that. Sir, uh, when we are coming to, uh, sir, up to the pulmonary artery, uh, there is uh, no, uh, sir, from RV to pulmonary artery, there is a significant uh, rise, uh, saturation, 8%, sir. Okay. Sir, so here this is. What, 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 is, what is required? Sir, required is sir, uh, uh, 755. Eh? Uh, uh, means sir, 5, sir. 5 at the great artery level. Okay, at the, at the great artery level, you require 5% five, uh, 5 increase in the uh, oxygen saturation is suggestive of. Step up. Uh, uh, step up uh, of uh, 8%, sir. So this is significant. Uh, here it is significant. More than 5 is enough. Okay, right. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Now, sir, uh, uh, sir, LA, uh, sir, there is a step down at the LV level. Okay. Sir, that only 2% is uh, significant here, significant uh, decrease of the saturation. Okay, uh, very good. Uh, so, there is a, um, at the level of, uh, that the, this is a uh, cell. So, hmm? uh, saturation, sir, uh, in the uh, systemic saturation decreased. Oh. Uh, sir, now I will go to the uh, sir, pressure. No, no, you, you tell uh, your interpretation here. So, there is a left to right shunt at the? Uh, sir, uh, left to right at the uh, sir, pulmon grade artery level. And, and, the right, and right to left uh, uh, at the uh, right ventricular level. Okay, very good. Ventricular level. Okay, right. Now, the uh, pressure data. Sir, so maybe sir, uh, non-restricted BST. Don't draw conclusions. Just sir, look at the sir, pressure data. Sir, then. from the pressure data, sir, uh, uh, A and B both are eight and eight. Sir, uh, uh, and the mean is six. Sir, little, uh, sir, uh, B is little higher. So normally, sir, in right that here, A is higher. And consider both uh, up to eight can be taken as normal. So I would yes, pass sir. it as upper limit of normal. Yes, sir. Yes, sir, okay. RV inflow 120 by 8 and RV outflow is sir 40 by 8. It means that there is a gradient at the uh, from inflow to outflow of okay. 80 mmHg. Okay. So RV outflow track gradient is there. Okay. Uh, sir, uh, sir, pulmonary artery, sir, there is uh, no, no gradient at the valvular level. Okay. Uh, sir, uh, now come to the sir, LA. No, no, you are, you are not commented about the pulmonary artery pressure. Is it normal or elevated? Uh, sir, pulmonary artery pressure mean is 26. Sir. Uh, normal now it is 20 only. Okay. Uh, 
and also systolic pressure is 40, all indicate, and the pulmonary diastolic pressure is 20, all three are elevated. Yes, sir. Okay. Yes, sir. Elevated. Sorry, sir. Answer, which? Sir, A is 9, B is 8. Sir, normally B is higher. On okay. the left side, okay. uh, and left ventricles, and the uh, left ventricle one twenty by eight normal. Okay. Aorta also said normal. Okay. So, uh, what is, uh, so sir, what is the uh, data? Yes, sir. From pressure data, sir, uh, right ventricular outflow tract obstruction. Okay. And sir, there is a desaturation at the uh, systemic. With this, uh, right, left to right shunt at the uh, whenever, whenever, whenever you have equalization of systolic RV, LV, what is your first yes, diagnosis? Uh, sir, uh, first oh, yeah, so, a lot of external noise is coming. Is, uh, uh, can you uh, mute yourself so that it does not interfere with the uh, our teaching program. Okay, so in a patient with uh, uh, where the systolic pressure of RV, LV, and IOTA are the same, what is the first condition that you should suspect? Uh, sir, a non destructive BST with overriding of IOTA. No, don't use all those things. Uh, whenever you are having RV with systolic pressure and LV systolic pressure and IOTA systolic pressure are the same, the first condition that you should suspect is. Tetralogy, oh, oh, yes. yes. So, what is the gradient across the RV outflow in mild, moderate, severe pulmonary stenosis with intact interventricular septum? What is the gradient across the RV outflow in uh, 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 in pulmonary stenosis with intact interventricular septum? Sir, it will be uh, same because same. it is always severe. Uh, RV no, no, I asked a question in a patient with uh, uh, pulmonary stenosis with intact interventricular septum. What is the pressure gradient? Did you say it is the same? The in, sir, with no. intact IVS. Sir, intact, intact, it will be sir, 25, 45, and sir, more than 60, sir. Right. Oh, no. Mild, Sist moderate, severe. Systolic is 30, severe. 50, and 70, sir. Uh, systolic and mean is 20, 35, and 50. Okay. Now, there are uh, different uh, um, uh, recommendations, but it is better to uh, simplest of memories gradient 25, 40, and 60 are the simplest to uh, uh, remember. If the gradient is, uh, or if the systolic pressure is, uh, um, uh, what, what should be the systolic pressure in the RV? Or mild pulmonary stenosis. Roughly it is 50, moderate up to 70 to 75, and if it is more than 75, it indicates severe pulmonary stenosis. So, uh, uh, in a patient with tetralogy of fellow, how what is the gradient mild, moderate, severe? Same, it will be same. same. Sir. And what is changing there? Why so the flow is changing. Sir. Flow is changing. So, uh, why the flow is changing? But according to the, the right to left shunt. Yeah, because when the, the obstruction is less, there is less of right to left shunt, and so more, more blood will flow across the RV outflow, giving rise to the same gradient. So in a patient with tetralogy of mild, mild, moderate, severe, you have got the same gradient, and what changes is the flow. In a patient with uh, uh, intact interventricular septum with pulmonary stenosis, the gradient changes, and the uh, gradient, the systolic pressure can be 50, 75, and above 75, which indicate more mild, moderate, severe pulmonary stenosis. Okay, right. Yes. So here, how will you how will you calculate the uh, the pulmonary vascular resistance is also high. What does that mean? Why the patient is having a, 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 a PA oxygen saturation step up? There may be uh, connecting map cars or something which is giving collaterals. The collaterals mm -hmm. are, uh, since the patient is having elevated pulmonary pressure, what is the possibility? Map cars may be there. Map cars is the possibility. Oh, more often it is a man-made shunt. And which, which shunt 
ിസ്റ്റൻസ്റ്റൻസ്റ്റൻസ്റ്റൻസ്റ്റൻസ്റ്റൻസ്റ്റൻസ്റ്റൻസ്റ്റൻസ്റ്റൻസ്റ്റ
Now you should be clear what is the purpose of doing these two views. The value of view is done when you want to separate right from left. LAO is done for VST. VST. Yes. Yes. LAO with cranial tilt will give you a good, uh, uh, good opacification of the VST. So whenever you want to separate right from left, right ventricle from left ventricle, right yes. atrium from left atrium, then you have to do an LA view. When, when do you do RIO view? When you want to separate atria from the ventricle. Yes. So in patients with mitral regurgitation, tricuspid regurgitation, if you want to evaluate, you should do a RIO view. So RIO is to uh, separate uh, 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 atria from the ventricle and the LA view is to separate right from the left. So here this is an RIO view when the, uh, when the uh, spine is seen on the right left side of the uh, image, it is a RIO view and the spine, the spine is seen on the right side of the image, it is a LAO view. So this is an RIO view, yes. And what do you see there? Sir, there is a pigtail uh, through uh, position through uh, right uh, um, femoral uh, artery to descending aorta. Uh, right no, no. Artery. To the so, so no, 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 no. From IBC to sir. IBC, yeah. yeah. IBC to RA to RB to pulmonary artery, sir. Yes, it is a pulmonary artery injection. Mm -hmm. And then you are looking at the liver phase of the. Yes, sir. Liver phase of the cardiac cycle. In order to make out a what is happening on the left side. No, you cannot make out MR from this, this view. For MR, you have to inject it to the left one degree. Here, what you are looking at is you are separating a, a left atrium from the. Uh, left ventricle, but you are trying to look at look at the connection between left atrium and the left ventricle. Here, actually, this is a difficult one. This is a case of port triatrium. If you are very careful, you can see that there are three chambers. I'll show you that. Yes, sir. Can we see? Can you see that? Yes, sir. There are three. Before three. left atria is filled, sir, there is another chamber filled. There's a see, there's a this is the one chamber. Then you can see another chamber here. Then there is the LV. So, this is actually a case of core trial creator. Now, it is we don't do an angiogram. This is angiogram was done for teaching purpose. We don't do angiogram because you can have the correct diagnosis by doing an echocardiogram. So, there is no need of an angiogram. So, this is a case of core trial creator. So if you are careful, you can see this is a this is the liver phase starting. And you can see the uh, one one chamber. Is... Oh, one chamber is filled. You can see that. See, so oh, it's moving, moving. Anyhow, you can see three chambers here. One is here. This is one chamber. Then you can see the next chamber. Then you can see the third chamber. So this is a case of core triatriatum. It's a very rare uh, to do an angiogram in a patient with core triatriatum nowadays. But uh, this was done for teaching purpose only. Okay, right. Diagnosis. This is a simple one. But I kept this uh, uh, so that you don't... Uh, uh, make a wrong diagnosis by just lo looking at the electrocardiogram. You have to analyze it. The atrial fibrillation left branch block. It's left one branch block, the atrial fibrillation. Because sometimes when this type of ECGs are shown, this is a broad QRS complex. People jump that it is a uh, ventricular tachycardia because you are not seeing P waves, you are seeing broad QRS. So suddenly people will jump and say it is a ventricular fibrillation. Sorry, ventricular tachycardia. You should carefully look for, the, you should scan the whole ECG and you can easily see that there is a, uh, it's quite irregular, indicating that this is a case of atrial fibrillation with existing left bundle branch block. Very good. Okay, now this one.
sinus tachycardia with short uh, pr interval with persistence of uh, r wave there is no uh, there is a positive concordance uh, throughout the v1 to v6 mm. with negative in 2 3 avf so most uh, and avr is positive most probably it will be vt uh, v Yeah, there is an avid association. You can make out that in the first one itself, you can see this is a P wave. Then probably there is a P wave here. There is a P wave here. So there is a total avid here. You can see there is a P wave here. You can see another P wave here. Another P wave here. So there is a accelerated idiopathic rhythm. Oh, well, uh, what is the rate? One hundred. Around about hundred, yes. It is a it's a case of accelerated idiopathic rhythm. With uh, you can uh, see that uh, the previous are independent. Another possibility that we can think about is so left posterior fascicular origin tachycardia can be there, sir. Okay, uh, uh, you can think of a fascicular uh, ventricular tachycardia where the rate can be here. The rate is actually this is one hundred ten. Hundred four, hundred ten. Hundred ten, hundred two, between hundred to hundred twenty. So slow VT and uh, with uh, QRS is not very broad, so it could be a fascicular VT. Another possibility that you can think about is anything of junction tachycardia. Junction tachycardia with uh, retrograde block also is a possibility. So, but of this, I, I think I would go for a. Uh, fascicular VT, and uh, if it is fascicular VT, where is the number starting from? Well, uh, Posterior fascicular. From the left side, and sir, uh, axis is sir uh, leftward. Uh, yeah. uh, so it is uh, uh, not from base. Uh, if it is a fascicular VT, it must be starting from the left. posterior fascicle. Posterior fascicle. Posterior fascicle. Yeah. And is traveling uh, delayed through the right bundle, so there is something like a uh, right bundle branch pattern, and also there is a uh, uh, left axis deviation yeah. indicating that this is a uh, with the embers starting from the left posterior fascicle. So it's a slow VT. Okay, right. Yes, good. Next suggest diagnosis. There is a cardiomegaly scene. It's a yes. calcification of the uh, calcification scene on the left border. Okay. That is, sir, uh, sir, possibly pulmonary artery. Uh, maybe so. No. And sir, RA is enlarged. No. So if you look at here, uh, you can see two uh, two lines are seen. Two lines PD. of par parallel calcification. What is PD. it? PD. Yes, very good. Excellent. It is a ductus calcification. Always you see this. So nowadays it is very difficult to see this type of a calcification. But when you see this type of a cal calcification where you can see two parallel lines, then you should think of the possibility of calcified ductus. And the patient has got huge left, uh, right pulmonary artery. right pulmonary artery, and on arteries. Uh, but there is a, a civilization and uh, uh, sorry, centralization. All these indicate the patient most likely is have PDA with Eisenmenger. So your peripheral vessels are periphery; it is completely cut off. 
You can see huge right pulmonary artery. Left pulmonary artery is difficult to see because it is behind the heart. Uh, so uh, right pulmonary artery you can easily make out. Endron vessels are seen. Peripheral cutoff is seen. All put together, patient is having evidence of uh, severe pulmonary artery hypertension. Uh, the calcified ductus and indicate that most likely it is a patent ductus arteriosus with Eisenmenger syndrome. Uh, please carefully look for this calcification because a ductal calcification is something which if it is present, you should be able to pick up and it is suggestive of, uh, uh, of uh, and the patient is having pulmonary artery hypertension, then you can always think of the possibility of uh, Eisenmenger syndrome due to uh, Byte inductus arteriosus. Diagnosis? Epstein. Epstein, very good. It's an Epstein's anomaly. The way you can see a large heart, uh, the, uh, the pulmonary artery outflow is, uh, the, the RV outflow is dilated, uh, the, the vessels are very small and narrow pedicle all put together, and our right atrium is grossly enlarged. It is suggestive of Epstein's anomaly. You should be able to diagnose. Epstein, and it was just one look. There should not be any difficulty to diagnose Epstein's anomaly. Very good. Diagnosis. ASD Eisenmenger? Yes, Eisenmenger. You cannot use the word Eisenmenger. Why did you say Eisenmenger? Sorry, sir. Yes. First of all, you should say why you said ASD. Sir, ASD because, sir, there is a cardiomegaly present. Oh. And, sir, uh, uh, prominent uh, uh, right to descending pulmonary arteries and RA also enlarged. Okay. So the apex is of the RV type. Uh, that you can be certain, but of course, the RA enlargement in a patient with shunt lesion goes more in favor of atrial septal defect. This RA is significantly enlarged. You can see endron vessels, plenty of them. Pulmonary artery segment is large. All put together, it is uh, suggestive of a shunt lesion and cardiac enlargement, right atrial enlargement, all go in favor of also, uh, the lesion being atrial septal defect. I think very good. Yes. We'll skip that. Very interesting echocardiogram. So in the first, we can see mass in the left atria from the Sir, interatrial septum, sir, aneurysm. What is this? Sir, interatrial septum, aneurysm. Any other thought process? Sir, Any uh, thrombus, sir, uh, paradoxical embolism going on. Yeah, very good. Actually, it is a thrombus migrating from the uh, from the right side through the... Yes. Sir, ASD or PFO. More than ASD, it is waiting for him in a way. The patient presented with a stroke and also had evidence of, uh, you can see that her right ventricle is significantly enlarged, uh, right atrium is enlarged. She has got evidence of pulmonary artery hypertension, so she must be having chronic thromboembolism into the pulmonary system, giving rise to pulmonary artery hypertension and RA and RV dilatation. And then she has got evidence of thrombus in transit. Thrombus in transit, so going through the in a uh, yeah. uh, yeah. way. And uh, uh, what is the treatment? Anticoagulation. Uh, anticoagulation, of course, is required. But uh, since this, this is an atom bomb. The closure is needed. Closure of it. Since this is an atom bomb because these patients can quickly go in for systemic embolization. Right. Only she had one systemic embolization. Another, embolic, uh, another systemic embolization may cripple her. And so, ideally, this patient should be operated and the uh, patent for amino oil should be closed. closed. So, that is the correct thing to do. But patient was not willing. And uh, the relatives also did not want to uh, subject her for a surgical procedure. And uh, she was given oral anticoagulation. Let me show you what happened. Not our oral, we gave environment anticoagulation for 10 days, followed by started on oral anticoagulation.
and uh, you can see that uh, what has happened to the uh, after the uh, anticoagulation what has happened to the uh, the thrombus no thrombus but all if you are very careful you may be able to see a very small one can you see a small one yes sir yes very little over a period of uh, 10 days of oral uh, parenteral anticoagulation everything settled down and she was discharged on oral anticoagulation and she has done extremely well so sometimes even though uh, the correct thing is to subject the patient for a, a, a surgical treatment with close to the patient for amen away if the patients are not willing sometimes the oral the parent anticoagulation uh, followed by oral anticoagulation sometimes can resolve the whole problem and in this patient everything was totally resolved and patient became perfect all right even her uh, pulmonary artery pressure also came down with uh, on follow up so there's a good possibility that oral anticoagulation parent or, or anticoagulation followed by oral anticoagulation sometimes can solve the whole problem so this was a case of uh, 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 clot on transit through the patent foramen vein uh, she had a embolic episode to the brain stroke she had multiple episodes to the pulmonary artery she had chronic uh, uh, pulmonary artery hypertension secondary to thromboembolism and she was uh, given anticoagulation and she significantly improved Okay, that's not moving. Anyhow, let's look at here. What is this? This is the B line, sir. Chest. Line. Uh, What does it indicate? Sir, pulmonary edema. Pulmonary edema. So this is a B line. This is the normal one. This is a patient with COPD, and these B lines. How many are required to diagnose pulmonary edema? More than three. More than five. Five or more. If you are seeing more than five or more uh, uh, B lines, that is suggestive of pulmonary edema. Any patient with coming with acute uh, breathlessness, when you, when you have great difficulty in diagnosing whether it is uh, uh, pulmonary edema or is it a COPD problem, uh, then you can always uh, do a scanning of the. ultrasound examination of the lung field and when you see b lines of this nature that is suggestive of pulmonary edema this suggestive of pulmonary edema so this patient uh, uh, this is pulmonary edema this is copd and this is normal uh, normal and copd practically the same the b lines are those horizontal one na no? or vertical one vertical vertical one vertical vertical okay the b lines in the uh, lung ultrasound is the vertical one these are the, these are the uh, uh, b lines while oh. the b lines when you look at the x ray chest what you see is the horizontal line ah uh, correct curly b yes sir this is actually these b lines are uh, vertical lines while the b lines that you see in x ray examination of the uh patient will be horizontal right yeah. okay, yes sorry this is not moving this track left so okay, there we leave it that left look at this uh, uh, ct What is the CT? There was a filling defect, sir, in uh, pulmonary. Yeah. So there was a filling defect in pulmonary. Uh... No, no, no. There is no no filling defect. It's not a case of pulmonary embolism. Even though that is the commonest condition for which we do a CT, but this is not pulmonary embolism.
what is this and what is this uh, the right one is pulmonary uh, artery very good and, right. artery. and this one uh, that one Okay. Uh, what is the what is the one which is ascending like? aorta, sir? Ascending aorta. This is ascending aorta. Dissection is there. This is ascending aorta and this is the pulmonary artery. And the ascending aorta is grossly dilated and is pressing on the pulmonary artery. And you can see dissection also here. Yeah, yeah, sir. It's grossly dilated pressing. And now you can see the see. Can you see the dissection? Ah, yes, sir, yes, sir. So this patient has got dissection, usually dilated pulmonary artery. And what condition it can we should be suspect? Marfan's. Okay, Marfan can be suspected. Very good. And uh, another. Hi. Hypertension uh, in the settings of MI, sir. Patient presented with acute chest chest pain. Uh, hugely dilated. This, this much dilation, dilation of the aorta. This is actually the aorta this patient was as big as 8 centimeters. And the patient was not a Marfan. So, what is the other thing that you should suspect? Bicuspid. Uh, yes, bicuspid aortic valve with. Aortic aneurysm, uh, aortic aortopathy. They can have a, a bicuspid aortic valve with aortopathy, which can give rise to a very grossly dilated ascending aorta. And uh, uh, these, these patients can develop dissection also. So, this was a case of uh, bicuspid aortic valve, aortopathy with uh, dilated aorta and uh, aortic dissection. And what is the surgical procedure for these patients? Benton. Huh? Sir, uh, uh, aortic uh, arch repair. Uh, aort sir, bental operation. Uh, bental procedure. Uh, do we do bental procedure or modified bental procedure? Okay. Modified is done with the uh, vortex graft. No, both are both you 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 say graft, but what is the difference between modified bental procedure and? Uh, the uh, one which described by Bendard. When the coronary artery is taken, uh, in a normal, in a modified Bendard procedure, you take a button of the uh, aorta around the coronary artery and then the uh, to the newly formed uh, or new aorta, the, the button is, uh, is, uh, is stitched in. Otherwise, when the coronary artery is directly stitched in, it was seen that they progressively de develop coronary stenosis. So, if uh, along with the coronary artery, a small button of the original aorta is taken and stitched into the newly formed aorta, that is known as bendal procedure, modified bendal procedure. Original bendal procedure did not recommend the removal of a small button of uh, aorta. And these patients developed, uh, patients over a period of time developed uh, uh, narrowing of the coronary artery and hence that was abandoned and was replaced by a modified bental procedure. And when the uh, aortic valve is not grossly damaged and you want to only, uh, you don't want to replace the aortic valve and repair the, uh, or replace only the arch of aorta, that is known as David's procedure. David's. Yeah. David's procedure. So these are the uh, procedures that are usually done for uh, aortopathy associated with bicuspid aortic valve. And what is this? This is also a still film of the uh, CT, CT angio. What does this indicate? Maybe difficult, but there is a communication here. So from LV, uh, aorta is arising. There is a communication. Uh -huh. LV is arising. Aorta is arising from LV. What is this communication? Some, uh, this is uh, aorta. This is pulmonary artery. What is this communication? AP window. AP window. window. You're right. AP window. This is an AP window. Uh, it's very rare to see, but... Uh, uh, we have got a collection of AP window. This is uh, aorta. This is pulmonary artery. So this is a uh, aorta to pulmonary artery communication. This is an AP window. Sir, in this truncus, how it will be? If it will do, means they will be same. Uh, like this. Sometimes it's difficult because uh, 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 type one truncus. Sometimes there's a difficulty to differentiate. But if you can see that this uh, this vessel is 
arising from the uh, right ventricle then you can be sure that it is a ap window. ap window okay diagnosis hocm hocm well, along with it is not only hocm uh, with sam with sam and mr mr MR. yes you can see the you can uh, make out the uh, mitral regurgitation you can make out the sam and this uh, uh, hypertrophic uh, obstructive cardiomyopathy uh, uh, what is this mri oh, yes sir cardiac mri three chamber view okay right very good okay i think we'll stop at the level we are uh, i think okay we we'll stop at that level so we have shown uh, some uh, a good number of uh, spot tests which may be useful to you in this exam because spot tests will be there in the examination okay next class what will we do shall we have a clinical case somebody who is willing sri ram would you like to bring one case okay sir so oh, you try to bring case one case so that we can have a discussion uh you bring your in which institute are you working sri ram amrita sir amrita so you can bring a case okay sir okay yes okay right any doubts if you want to ask any doubt yes otherwise we'll stop okay right so see you next week we'll have a case from sri ram and then we'll discuss the case right okay thank you sir Okay, thank you sir okay right, good night thank you it's a good night with your permission shall we continue sir yes please yeah okay thank you very much thank you bye good night